Okay, we'll go ahead and get started with section 1.2. In section 1.2, we're going to continue with the alternative force choice framework that we started discussing in section 1. In particular, this example that we're going to look at here has two outcomes and is centered on whether or not somebody has the ability to identify when they're being stared at. All right, let's go ahead and get started. The author of the uh, study that we're going to be looking at, his name is Rupert Sheldrick, and he has studied a variety of aspects around consciousness in animals and in people. Uh, for example, he's studied the apparent abilities of animals to anticipate earthquakes. And he's also studied um, these types of behaviors in humans. And in particular, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at the uncanny sense of being stared at, whether or not that's a real phenomenon or not. A brief description of Sheldrick's studies regarding the sense of being stared at is provided in the video here. That link for that video is provided here and is also on our course website. In this video, he actually shows us the experiment that he's run on many individuals many different individuals. I want you to pay particular attention at about the one minute mark. There will be a lady that actually participates in this study. Rupert is going to either look at that woman or not look at that woman and she has to identify when that is the case. So I'll pause here and let you watch that video and I will see you right back. Okay, welcome back. There was a statement that was made in this video and that statement was brilliant, 14 correct, and 6 wrong. And that is the statement that we're going to be looking at in the remainder of this section. He certainly gave the impression that 14 correct and 6 wrong was indication that this woman had the ability to identify uh, that somebody was staring at her. And we're going to use a simulation model here to be able to identify how likely that is to happen. Okay, So a simulation model requires a specification of the number of trials and the likelihood or chance of obtaining a correct response. The number of trials in this particular uh, particular example is 20 trials again. Okay, There were right 16, uh, 14 correct and 6 wrong. So a total of 20 trials. So that number is actually like the previous example. We also need to identify the likelihood or chance of correcting a, of obtaining a correct response. Excuse me. Now, before we can determine this likelihood, we must decide for whom is the simulation study going to mimic. Okay. For example, the deafness example, the simulation study mimic the outcomes from someone who could not hear. So let's think a minute about what we did. We were trying to figure out whether or not the individual under investigation was lying. And what we did is we compared that individual not to lying individuals, but instead the outcomes that we would expect from deaf people. Now, if we were to use that same process okay, in this particular study, we're going to want to compare the woman. Okay, we're trying to figure out whether or not the woman in the video has the ability to hear. And what are, are we going to compare her against? Well, we're going to compare her against women who do not have the ability to identify. So we're going to use that same framework that we used when we did the deafness example. Now, the reason we do the individuals that do not have the ability to identify is quite simply because it's easiest. If they don't have the ability to identify when they're being stared at, then we simply have to guess. Right? So if that individual in the video had no ability, then she would just have to guess. She would either have to say look or no look. Okay? So an individual then that has to guess, and there's two outcomes here, that individual is going to have a one out of two chance in other words, a 50-50 chance. Okay, so the number of trials in the staring example is going to be 20. And the likelihood of obtaining a correct response 
again, for a person who must guess, is 1 out of 2, or a 50-50 example. Now, some questions. Suppose a woman does not have the ability to identify when somebody is staring at them, and then must guess on each of the 20 trials. How many is she going to get correct? Okay, this quantity is referred to, again, as the expected value. And to compute that expected value, we simply take the number of trials, which is 20, and we multiply it by the likelihood, or the probability, of a correct response. In this case, there's going to be a 50-50. So we multiply that 20 times 0 0.50, and we get 10. Now, what does this 10 indicate, or how do we refer to this value? 10 is the expected number of correct for a person person who must guess okay now how about the second question here okay the second question is to identify on our number line what various outcomes would imply so what would it mean if a woman got 20 correct okay well if there were 20 trials and she got all 20 correct, then I would certainly believe, okay, even the skeptic that I am, that she has the ability. So very high numbers on this number line are going to indicate that somebody does have the ability to identify when they're being stared at. Okay. Now values near the middle of the number line are going to identify somebody that does not have the ability. Again, a guessing person Okay, a guessing person is going to just have a 1 in 2 chance of being correct. So they're going to end up somewhere here in the middle. And let's go ahead and use this pyramid here to indicate, excuse me, let's go ahead and just use this pyramid here to kind of indicate people of no ability. Now, what we need to do is identify whether or not 14, so that's the study outcome that we had, whether or not 14 is far enough away from the no ability people okay so is 14 an outlier against my no ability people in the way that I have it drawn here it does not look excuse me in the way that I have it drawn here it looks like 14 is an outlier but what we haven't determined yet is how fat or how skinny okay we don't know how fat or how skinny this no ability situation is so if that no ability pyramid is actually quite wide then somebody at 14 is going to be in within the realm of the no ability people so the main purpose of that simulation study again is to identify excuse me sorry about that the main purpose of that simulation study is to identify kind of where the boundaries are between the no ability and the ability people Okay. So trying to identify whether or not 14 is going to be an outlier is the big picture here. Certainly if they are an outlier, if they're up towards that upper end, then they're going to have the ability. Okay, And if near, near the middle, then that's the no ability range as I just said. Now this is a little different than the previous example because in the previous example we were worried about what was going on down here on the left hand side. Again, in that previous example, we were trying to identify whether or not somebody was lying or trying to throw us off. Okay, well, in this case, we don't believe that this individual is lying, but instead, what we're trying to do is evaluate whether or not an individual has the ability. Okay, so I care about the upper side of this distribution here. All right, so let's just, oops, let's go ahead and just recap that. Okay. The key question then is, does 14 correct out of the 20 provide enough statistical evidence to suggest the woman in the video has the ability to identify when somebody's staring at her? And we simply answer that question by determining whether or not 14 is an outlier against those who cannot identify when somebody is staring at them. So again, if we go back up here, we're going to compare the study outcome 14 against this distribution right here the outcomes from a no ability situation okay
All right. Now, how are we going to generate outcomes from a knowability situation? In the previous example uh, section, we used that app that I created with the two lights and the sound. Well, that one doesn't apply here. But I do have a second app that was created, and this one's a little bit more general. It can be used in any 2AFC example. So how do we use that app? The link for that app, excuse me, is here. Maybe I should mention that before I get started. So let's go ahead and I'll go to that web page there now and show you how to use this app. Okay, when using this app, I need to identify the two labels or the two outcomes. And those two outcomes are going to be correct and incorrect. Okay. Now, we need to be a little bit careful with this. The two outcomes that the individual in the video provided was either look or no look. But th those aren't the labels that I care about. Remember, the statement that I'm trying to evaluate is brilliant, 14 correct, and 6 wrong. So I'm trying to evaluate the correctness of the responses. Okay. Now, under a situation where they must guess at the outcomes, the chance of them getting it correct is going to be 50%, and the chance of getting them incorrect is going to be 50%. So this is what we would say is a 50-50 example. When entering those probabilities, we want to enter those as decimal values as shown here. Now the number of trials, okay, or often referred to as the sample size is 20 here, so we need to put 20 in that box. And we simply hit Run Simulation. And in this particular outcome, I had 12 correct and 8 incorrect. Okay, I'm going to go back to the notes now and explain a little bit more detail about what that app is doing. Alright, so how did we set this particular app up? Again, there were two outcomes specified, either correct or incorrect. The probabilities Okay, for the correct were 50% and for incorrect was 50% and there were a total number of trials, excuse me, there was 20 trials that were completed here. Now, on the first trial, okay, a woman who did not have the ability, right, to identify when someone was staring at her, so again the guessing situation, okay, so on this first trial, a woman that did not have the ability went ahead and tried to guess the correct outcome. She actually got it right. Okay, so this first outcome was correct here. We can see on line one over there that the first outcome was correct. On her second guess, so on the second line over here to the right, we can see she got that one correct as well. On the third one though, she was incorrect. And what that tally is up at the top there, it just represents how many correct or how many incorrect she got for that particular simulation run. Now, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to want, excuse me, we're going to want to do several simulation runs to get an idea of what reasonable outcomes are for people who cannot identify when somebody's staring at them. So I want I went ahead and ran 10. I showed you a few of them here. I think I will hit pause here or stop here and I want you to go and get 10 outcomes as well. And then we will go ahead and plot those below. So using the simulation app okay, that I showed you here with that link, go ahead and correctly set that up and then get 10 different repeated outcomes, okay, 10 different tallies. And then I will uh, stop here and let you do that and then we'll come right back. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and use my numbers in here, and I would like you to use yours. My first outcome was an 11, so in other words, 11 correct and 9 incorrect. My second simulation outcome was a 9. My third was a 13. My fourth one was a 6. My fifth one was a 12. Oops, let's see if I can get the video. It was 12. And then I had an 8, and then 11, I had another 12, and I had a 9, 
And then on the last one, I had a 10. OK, let's go ahead and just plot these on the number line that we have here. I realize this is kind of cumbersome. We'll go ahead and try to do this, though. So number, uh, the first simulation run was 11. So I'll go ahead and put a x there at 11. And then I had a 9, right? And then I had a 13. And then I had a 6. And then I had a 12. And then an 8. An 11. So another 11 there. Another 12. A 9. Two 9s. And then down below, I'm going to ask you to mark one of them. I went ahead and marked that one ahead of time. And my last one was a 10. So I'll use that one as my marked dot. OK, so how many simulations or dots are represented on the plot above? Well, there were 10 simulations or dots. OK, so a total of 10 simulations were done. This gives us 10 dots. OK, so circle a dot on the plot above, which I had done that ahead of time. So that's number 10. Describe the process by which this dot was obtained. OK, so what does this 10 mean? So what this means is there were 10 correct guesses Okay, out of 20, right? So when we're identifying a dot, we should talk about what was the total number of possible. And then also, so there was 10 correct guesses out of 20. And this dot was obtained for guessing people. OK, so we should probably identify also what situation was this dot obtained from. And this dot was obtained from guessing people or in this particular case, people who did not, or people who could not identify when someone was staring at them, right? All right, next question. What outcomes would you expect if one does not have the ability. Okay, well, these are the outcomes that I got from that simulated model, which is again mimicking outcomes for people who do not have the ability. So, what outcomes would I expect? Well, it looks like anywhere from 6 up to 13 or so would be outcomes that I would expect. So, for my particular study, or simulation, excuse me. For my simulation, I would expect values between 6 and 13. Now, one thing to notice is that 10 was my expected outcome, okay? And from this, I went so. 10 was my expected outcome, so I actually went about 4 down. Okay, so it's reasonable to go, what can we say here? It is likely to drift about 4 down. All right. On the high side, my maximum out of these 10 was actually a 13. Okay, so I would anticipate that I would expect. Okay, so it is likely to drift about four down and maybe about three or four up. Okay, now even though I didn't get one that was four above, okay, I did get one that was four below. All right, so this amount that we go down and how much we go up, at least in this particular situation, should be fairly even. Okay. Now, we didn't actually get a 14, but it should be somewhat even here to the left and to the right. 
at least for the situation that we're talking about here. In other words, where is that pyramid at? That pyramid is pretty, should be pretty even to the left and to the right here. Okay, that distribution is going to be pretty even to the left and to the right. This is certainly the case when we have 50-50 examples like we have here. All right, how about the next question? What outcomes would be surprising then? So if we've, we're saying anywhere um, around 10 and maybe about 3 or 4 above 10 and also 3 or 4 below 10 would be likely outcomes, then unlikely outcomes, okay, what outcomes would be surprising or unlikely outcomes? So what we mean by surprising outcomes is basically the same as unlikely outcomes or outliers, right? That's what we're trying to get at here. So maybe we should just say it that way. Okay, outliers would be would be values more than say 4 above well how about we just outliers would be values more than 14 and less than 5 does that make sense another word another way to say this is outliers would be values would be values more than four away from the expected. Okay? Now again, we care more about the outliers, outliers on the high side here. Okay? So values near the top or near the how about we say values near the upper end of the distribution or dots are of more interest than values on the lower side. Okay, we'll, we'll keep coming back to that idea of whether or not we care about the upper side or the lower side. Now, next question. Is your graph the same as mine? Well, the answer to that should be no. Okay, your graph will be slightly different than mine. Okay, because these are random outcomes. Because the outcomes obtained are random. If we're guessing, then we're going to have random outcomes here. So they should not, should not have, oops, should not have the same outcomes. All right, how about the next question? Using the results from these simulations, how many correct would a woman in the video have to get correct before you're convinced that she has the ability to identify when somebody's staring at her. Okay, so for my simulation, so let's answer this one here. From my simulation, I did not get a value higher than 14. Okay, values higher than 14 would be unlikely for someone who is guessing. Thus, anybody, anyone outside of my dots would be unusual, at least out of 10 simulations. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Okay, I only did 10 simulations, but my 10 simulations, 14 is outside of that. Okay, now, just barely outside of it, but it is outside of it. Okay, so how do I use this then? 
how can we make a decision about this? Okay, from my simulation, it appears this woman may have the ability, okay, this woman may have the ability because she is outside the no ability people. All right, a little bit more on that in a minute, okay? All right, a couple more questions here. Consider the following, okay, outcomes from other people in the class. So my outcome was at 14, right? I said anything bigger than 14 would be unusual. Suppose somebody else's graph was at 15. Okay, we had another individual in the class that was at 13, another individual in the class that was at 16. Now, how do these cutoffs compare to the one that you obtained? Well, my cutoff was at 14. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. My cutoff was at 14. Let's see here. Sorry about this. We'll get the right size eventually. My cutoff was at 14. Uh, classmate number two was a little below mine. Two other classmates were above mine at 15 and 16. Okay, now as I said, not everybody's going to have exactly the same picture, so their cutoffs might be slightly different. One thing that we could do though is maybe kind of combine the outcomes from many different, okay, so from many different classmates. I mean, I did mine based on 10 and I got 14. Classmate number one did theirs based on 10 and got 15. If we kind of combine them, okay, that would be actually 20 simulated outcomes. And combined, we would say that in order to be an outlier, we should be right around 14 or 15. If we take that information from classmate number two, which has another 10 simulated outcomes, Okay, so now we'd be up to 30, and we uh, might as well include classmate number 3 as well. We have another 10 simulated outcomes. If we combine the results across many, across additional simulations, we can, we can get a better overall picture of what a reasonable cutoff value should be. Okay, so we could combine all four, we could combine all four into all right, sorry about that. We could combine all four. So kind of take an average of 14, 15, 13, and 16. Okay, and if we do that, that average will be around uh, 14, 15, or 16 or so. Around 14 or 15 probably. Okay. So using uh, cutoff values um, based on more simulated outcomes is certainly better than based on just 10. Now if we're trying to make a decision, we can take that a little bit further if we wanted. And in the following, I actually created a graph using a software package. Okay, So you don't have the ability to do this graph quite yet. But we're going to show you that in the next section. So I created this graph here for the outcomes that we're interested in studying here. 
and this was done on 100 simulated outcomes. So not 10, but 100. So certainly we have a much better idea of where cutoffs should be. And as we can see, the cutoffs tend to be right around 14. We actually didn't get any 15s when I did it, but I did get a 16. Okay, so the cutoff probably is right around 14 here. All right, we might want to move our cutoff up here to 17, but when we do that, we're allowing just one observation here at 16 to kind of drive where that cutoff goes. And we want to be a little bit careful with that. We don't want a fluke observation to determine where our cutoff goes. Okay, so I would suggest that a reasonable cutoff is right about 14 here from this from these, excuse me, 100 simulated outcomes. Now if we were to circle a dot on this graph, so let's go ahead and circle one at 12 here. I can't circle that very easily in Google Sheets, but I can just say the circled graph is at 12. So the circled dot at 12, suppose. Okay. What uh, de excuse me, describe the process by which this dot was obtained. Well, it's exactly the same process that we talked about up above. Okay, the process doesn't change. So this individual individual got 12 correct out of 20, right? Got 12 correct out of 20. And this dot was generated under the situation of not having the ability to identify when someone is staring at them. Okay, so it's still that did not have the ab ability to identify when someone's staring at them. And I know that because the center of this pyramid is right here at 10 under the no ability situation. So we talked about that earlier, the expected count here is 10, okay, and that would be the no ability situation. So these jots, dots were generated under the no ability situation. Okay, just a couple more questions here. A statistician would trust a graph based on 100 simu simulated outcomes more than 10 when determining the upper cutoff. Okay. Would you trust a graph with 100 simulated outcomes more than 10? Okay, so I hope you answer yes to this. Now, some students believe that when you get more and more dots, you end up getting more and more kind of wacky outcomes. And that's not really true. Okay, what the additional outcomes are going to do is really help us identify where this graph kind of settles down where this pyramid settles down. Okay, so we really need to figure out kind of where this pyramid ends, all right, or where it collapses down here where we don't see outcomes anymore. One problem with a lot of the stuff that we statisticians do is we're interested in what's going on in the tail or the edges of these distributions. Okay, but we really want to try to find that dividing line there between the no ability and the ability. But on the edges of these distributions, these are not very likely outcomes. Okay, so we're kind of in a catch-22 there. We really want to try to nail down that division line, but we're out here where outcomes aren't very likely. And that kind of proves to be difficult. So when we're generating these distributions, we'd like to use lots and lots and lots of observations, or lots of simulated outcomes, excuse me. Okay, so we want more dots here. We can, this graph is going to be a better representation of what's going on for the no ability people if I get a whole bunch of people with no ability and have them do the 20 questions like the individual in the video. So for that reason, a graph, so yes, a graph based on 100 iterations or simulated outcomes will allow us to better determine where 
the cutoff value should be between the likely and unlikely outcomes for um, those for individuals who do not have the ability. Remember that's what we're trying to model here. Okay, suppose a, another statistician created another graph of 100 simulated outcomes. Would their cutoff value uh, be close to mine? Yeah, we would anticipate that to be the case. So even though we're going to have different graphs, when you base the cutoff value on lots and lots and lots of simulated outcomes, okay, their graph is going to be pretty much the same as mine. All right? So we don't have to worry too much about different statisticians sti different statisticians getting different um, cutoff values when they're based on lots and lots of simulations. So let's go ahead and answer this question I guess. Suppose the second statistician created another graph would their cutoff value be close to mine? Yes. It should be close because both statisticians statisticians used many simulated outcomes. Okay. This would not necessarily be the case when only a few simulated outcomes are used. Okay. For example, when we're only using 10 Okay, simulated outcomes as we did earlier, I had different classmates getting different values. I got 14, then up to 16, then down to 13, 15 was kind of in the middle there. But people were kind of bouncing, the different classmates were kind of bouncing all over the place. That problem is going to go away if we use many, many simulated outcomes. Okay, I think that brings us to the end of section 1.2's notes. In section 1.3, what we're going to do is talk about how to generate okay, these graphs when we want to use many, many simulated outcomes instead of just a few. Okay, see you later.